What's up and welcome to another episode of the Grind Line Podcast. You're listening to episode 288. I am your host, Greg. What's funny, Ryan? What? You're muted. Talk about Tyler being muted. You're muted. How am I muted? I, now you're not. What's funny? Tyler, just as soon as you start, boom. Yeah, just the eating on face. camera, Tyler. People, it, like, Dick we're wild. not a... We're not a mukbang uh, YouTube channel where people just eat on camera. Yeah, I'll just pay, uh, paste that picture of you from earlier in over your picture while, every time you're eating. Uh, but we do have an episode tonight. There was a little bit of uh, not news around the Red Wings, but a Red Wing named in something from NHL Network. There were some offer sheets that went out and uh, were signed. There is a, we're going to clear up some trade stuff, and I think that's where we're going to start. But how are you guys doing tonight before we get to that? The stomach bug has officially left the family after literally all five of us were hit like freaking dominoes over the past weekend. Yeah, I didn't that's, need you running to the bathroom in the middle of a podcast recording. Uh, it would have it would have been happening because that's about the time that it hit me on Monday night or actually it was finishing up on Monday night. But uh, yeah, it was not pretty. Jack's the trooper. He only puked twice and then he was done. He was like, I'm, I'm good. I don't know what you, your guys' problems are. And little kids puke all the time, so that's nothing new. Once was all over his bed, which I almost threw up just trying to go into the bedroom to, and help clean it, which Chelsea took care of that one. And then he puked partly on me as after that one was done. So that was fun. You're like my wife. You can't deal with that. But we're going to stop talking about no. puke and uh, ty we're going to move to Tyler. <laughs> Yeah, I don't do well with puke either, so we'll move on from that. But I'm doing good. Uh, I'll tell you what, this morning here in Massachusetts, it was in the 50s when I woke up and went outside to go to the gym this morning. And uh, I'm like, man, it's hockey and football weather. It's starting to feel like fall, which I know weekend. people don't. I know I know people don't really like the wintertime and the, the fall, but I love the winter and the fall. Um, the weather's great and sports. So, uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to hockey, man, and, and football, obviously. But so I think we're going to start after we've done talking about sports that aren't hockey. I think we're going to start <laughs> with uh, just calming some stuff down really quick. So there was a trade that was made uh, this past week that people are freaking out about. Not not in a bad way that well, I'm in a bad way for the Red Wings they are trying to freak out because the Edmonton Oilers were able to send Cody Ceci to the Sharks with a 2025 third round pick. And they got a player back. They got defenseman Ty Emerson. He's a young kid. Uh, nothing super to write home about. But they were able to offload Cody Cece, who is worse than what people are saying, Jake Wallman, which is true. And they only had to send a third round pick. And they got something back. So people immediately, immediately started jumping on the, what the hell was Eiserman thinking? There's no way someone wouldn't have given you something for Jake Wallman. The Oilers were able to get rid of CC for nothing uh, and get something back for him. And it started off the whole Iserman hate bandwagon again right before, you know, training camp starts in a couple weeks. But there is a differentiator between the two trades. And I'm going to let Ryan talk about it because I think Ryan is going to talk himself into a, an angry situation by doing this. So, Ryan, go ahead. There's nothing to talk about. It's a simple trade. The guy that they got back, first of all, this 24-year-old defenseman, is an RFA. So now they pretty much got rid of the rights of a guy that they probably weren't going to bring back and keep it in their system. So that might as well be future considerations. And then they traded a guy in Cody Cece who was on an expiring contract, meaning going into the last year, and they gave a third-round pick, whereas Jake Wallman had two more years at double the salary. It's really pretty simple to look at it and be like, and the, the second round pick that Detroit traded away, they had all of 15 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe 30. I don't know. Regardless, it doesn't matter. The simplest way to look at it, two years of contract, one year of contract. A guy that's going to go into an expiring deal, you know what you're going to get from him. He was on a team that just made the Stanley Cup Finals. There's a little bit more weight there, but at the same time, I mean, you look at it, 25, he's got 25 points last year in 79 games. Jake Wallman, 21 points in 63 games. Wallman probably would have finished a little bit higher than him, but at the same point, like they're different types of players. 
and you look at a San Jose roster, they're going to take what they can get. And hey, guess what? That could be, very well be a defensive pairing for them next season. Whatever. But the fact of the matter is, get over it. Wallman's gone. No more gritty. Oh, no. Yeah, I think it was just that they saw the return, like getting something actually like a player back and giving up a later pick. But again, it's the length of the contract. So you send Jake Wallman has an extra year on his deal. Cody sorry, says he's done quick. after the Emerson season. they'll have through into the this this coming season. Then he's an RFA, but yeah, whatever. But he's a young player and he can play in the AHL. It doesn't matter. Whatever. So people need to like. I think it's again. It is too. Don't be hasty with the reaction when you got dig, just dig like one more layer down to find that yeah it's a little easier to get rid of a player on an expiring deal than it is to get rid of a player who has another year left on their contract. Now for a team, like you said, for a team like San Jose, they'll play both those guys. They'll play CC and they'll play Wallman because they're not a good team. So those players have value to that team, but there are different levels of value in that the length of their contracts are a year apart. So it will always take, more of a give to offload a longer contract than it will to offload a shorter one. People have to be annoyed about everything. If something doesn't go the way that they, they envisioned that it, it would go, there's a giant problem. Oh my God, Jake Wallman didn't get us anything. Well, I Emerson didn't, or Cody CC didn't get the Edmonton Oilers anything. So I, I don't see the problem here. I think it's a nothing burger. At the end of the day, two teams got rid of players that were taking up a roster spot and salary, freed up a roster spot and salary, and had to offload a pick in return. So we're in agreement. Everyone needs to chill out about the Jake Wallman thing. Said so that when it happened. Yeah. Okay. So chill out about I'll, the Jake I'll Wallman. take that back. I'll, rec- I'll, I'll back up, up a little bit. I was initially shocked. Because we all, I think, thought and were going into it that he was going to be part of the roster. He's not, but it'll be okay. I was shocked, too. If you're a Red Wings fan and you say that you weren't shocked, you're an idiot. Unless you're someone that that knows what may or may not have happened, right? Like, I just think people are just so quick to be like, oh, no, see, this is Iserman not getting the most for his players. It's like, dude. Like, stop. I don't know. It's, it's just frustrating. But anyhow. All right. So we're done talking about it. We have shut down the Jake Wallman stuff for the off season going into the season. We do not need to talk about it anymore. So we're going to move on to the next Red Wings thing of the night. So the next Red Wings thing of the night. And it's nice to see the NHL network had tweeted out despite missing 14 games last season. Dylan Larkin still scored a career high 33 goals. The Red Wings captain moved up to number 15 on the top 20 centers right now. Previously, he was number 19. So in order, all 20, Connor McDavid, Nathan McKinnon, Austin mm-hmm. Matthews, Leon Dreisaitl, Alexander Barkov, Sidney Crosby, Braden Point, Jack Eichel, Jack Hughes, Elias Pettersson. That's the first 10. And then we've got JT Miller, Sebastian Ajo, Connor Bedard, Rupe Hintz, Dylan Larkin, Nick Suzuki, Tim Stutzla, Robert Thomas, Mika Zibanejad, and Nico Hishier. There are some names on there I don't agree with above Larkin. There are some names on there I JT don't agree with. Miller above Larkin? Below Larkin. Uh, Mika Connor Zibanejad Bedard? below Larkin. Not, I'm not going to discredit anything of what Connor Bedard is going to be. I think he's going to be one of the top players in this league. As of right now, he is not a better center than Dylan Larkin. No. I'm, that's, I'm sorry. No. That, I, I cannot agree with that one. I could argue that Rupe, Rupe Hintz is not a better center than Dylan Larkin. Doesn't Rupe Hintz play the wing a lot of the time, too? And same with JT Miller. I know JT Miller earlier in his career with the Rangers played a lot of wing, played center, and then played more wing. I don't know if now in, in Vancouver he's playing center specifically only. But if that's not the case, then I don't agree with JT Miller on that list either ahead of Larkin. Yeah, okay, so Tyler, I think you're onto something here. Um, he only took last season 566 faceoffs. Compare that to the number one center Tate Ice or centerman, uh, Sidney Crosby, in terms of faceoff draws, he took 1872. Historically, NHL network lists are always kind of 
weird or well, off. Larkin had to, with missing several games had 1293. So again, NHL network lists are always sometimes kind of off. And this is another one where like, yes, there are guys who are higher than they should be. So I have filtered. All right. I'm looking at position of center with looking at um, NHL.com slash stats. I've got it filtered down to center. I've got the report on face off percentages and I've got a hundred rows. Connor Bedard is not even listed. List is very inaccurate as is mostly NHL network. But Although Stutzel, honestly, I kind of like NHL. Stutzel's not even on here. We Art talked about that one before with him being more of a wing than a center as it is. He's not even in the top 100 for face-off percentages. Let's go to face-off wins and losses. Can we just be happy that Dylan Larkin Good is stop. on a top 20 not list? <laughs> Bedard, not there. What is that? This is stupid. It should be top 15. So I think what they're doing, Ryan, is they're also taking in like, here's all the goals they scored. And because that was the top thing they said, they're like, he, despite missing 14 games, he scored a career high 33 goals. So they're like ranking based on a number of goals that the center scored, even though that's not the most important thing to a center, really. Let's see. I'm looking up Bedard, a total of 532 face-offs and won a whopping 38.9%. Tim Stutzla, 46% on the draw last season, but what was his total face-offs? Are you kidding me? He took under 500 face face-offs last year, last year, which is normal he's listed, because he's bad. Like Ryan's Ryan's mad because they, they do these lists and then they're like, well, I guess it's top 20 ranked on points, not really ranked on, you know, some of the main things of being a center. And I agree. Like, I think Dylan Larkin should be above Rupe Hints. JT Miller should be lower. I think Mika Zibanejad should be higher. I think Mika Zibanejad is better than number 19 on the list. So there's some wiggle room. Like, I think Mika Zibanejad is better than Nick Suzuki. I think he's better than Robert Thomas. I'd, I'd probably have him in the top 15 as well. So I do, though, agree. Dylan Larkin does belong in, I would say, the top 15. Absolutely. And it just, again, someone pointed out, like, he's just hitting his stride. Like, he plays a full season. There's more room to grow there. Does he go up to number 12 next uh, as of next season? But it's, again, the, the list seems to be rather subjective. We, we've talked about this the last couple of years, and the biggest thing, unfortunately, and most people can say that it's unreliability in a sense, but he's been hurt, and he hasn't been able to get past that point. But you look at what he's done from a center point of view, and he's putting up their near point per game player. There is only 24 guys in the NHL and not all of them. All right, let me change that. I should have changed the gameplay limit, but major there are 18 guys that played as many games or more of Larkin that average a point or more. And then there's several that were below them. So only 18 guys in the league that played a full-time role as a centerman had a point per game. Larkin was one of them. We talked about it, I think, pretty heavily after last season, not this current off season, but last summer, that had he been healthy, he would have easily been one of the top 10, top 15 scoring centermen in hockey. We would have seen that again this season had he been able to stay healthy. That's unfortunately been kind of his Achilles heel at this point is just staying healthy. If he can do that with the way that the roster is kind of put together going into this season, there is no doubt in my mind that he can eclipse 82 points and push for 90 plus. I, I think that absolutely can happen. And the way that he corresponds his defensive play defensively, excuse me, defensive play into all of that puts him right up there. And I think where he's at now, 15 as a whole is fair, right? 15. Yep. He's at 15. So, to me, that seems appropriate. Again, there's some of these guys on here that arguably should not be on the list because I am looking at their faceoffs, but they're still a center, if you want to use my air quotes there. So I, I think that's still fair. I, th I think he could be higher. There's no reason why you can't argue him as a top 10 centerman. But I, what I think is going to be most important is a full 80 to 82 games this year. 
and getting him up over that hump of the points and truly maintaining that point per game average and closing in the, on that 90 point range. And then I see there's where that top 10 bump could occur. I think that to, to go along with that though, it's having consistent line mates most of the season. It's not dropping cat down to the second yep. per 20 games and then bringing him back up. I think that if you ran Alex to bring it, Dylan Lark and Lucas Raymond, which I hope that that's what they run as their top line, that it sticks like that for a, a long period of time because when you saw Alex Dabrinkit's production kind of fall off a bit for, for stretches, they ended up popping him down instead of being consistent. And I think that consistency is the way to get people back like that. So you want Alex Dabrinkit after maybe five games of not putting a goal in, don't move him down. Just keep it consistent. Keep him with Larkin and Raymond, and that'll help Dylan Larkin too. Because we saw that Alex Dabrinkit is not just a goal scorer, but he can also facilitate. And he's a pretty good playmaker. So mm -hmm. when he, if he can get, if he's just hitting posts and hitting posts for five games, let him keep getting those chances. Because moving him down is more than likely going to take those chances away from him. And he's not going to score for a longer stretch. Yeah, I, the only thing I kind of disagree with is like that's just what teams do and that's like a, just a thing in hockey when something's not going well you kind of have to switch it up a little bit like even do you see some of the best lines of all time will even get broken up at times like the perfection line in boston gets broken up all the time um and then it obviously ends up back together but even like think about the, the zetterberg and datsuk days they weren't always together but when they were apart they were just as good and then you put them together like wow but there were times where you had them together and it's like, okay, no, we need to split the wealth. But I feel like you you do that with this team too. Like, like those are your three best players on offense. But then you have Patrick Kane. Who's he playing with? You know what I mean? Like, Tarasenko and like Comper. Yes. Okay. And and yes, you could say that Tarasenko and Kane have some some chemistry from the days with the Rangers a little bit. But even then, if you think back, those Rangers teams weren't very good with with Kane and Tarasenko. They were a very good team, but like specifically those two guys didn't fit in the way that I think they, that people thought they were going to. And maybe that was just because it was at the trade deadline and they played a little bit of a different style. I don't know. But if you think about it, that Rangers team, a lot of people thought was going to win the Stanley cup and they didn't even get out of the first round. They lost to New Jersey in the first round. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to happen. I mean, it's regardless of whether they get broken up, it's it's going to be short-lived. And I think what's going to be important this season exactly. is watching what happens with Lucas Raymond. Because now that's going to open up. If you've got a line of Raymond, Debrinkit, and Larkin, that's going to now put more focus, take a lot of focus off Alex Debrinkit. The shot's already known. There's no doubt what damage he can do. And we saw it as the season came to a close, he started using it in different ways instead of just trying to grip it and rip it and go for that one tee. Like the one goal that stands out in my mind is the, the Montreal game toward the end of the year. And he was starting to fling the puck a little bit more to the net, but it was grab it and go. It wasn't he, grab He it, became a little bit more of go. the sneaky Alex to bring it, like yes. getting moving around into the open ice and finding space instead of just trying to fire, fire, fire. And, but what that's going to be great is that even if that necessarily doesn't go in the net, it's going to cause havoc. And the way that we saw Raymond come out at the end of the year, particularly when Lake Larkin was out, that's what we need that impact though when Larkin is there and it was there. So now if you've got all three of those guys going at a high level, that could be one of the top lines in hockey. Could be. Not saying yeah. it is. There's the, there's the potential that we've seen for too many years now of what some of these guys in the wings could be doing. This might be the year that it finally cracks that that layer. We just need Lucas Raymond to pick up where he left off is what we yes. need to do. He needs to start the season like he ended last season. Then they're going to be like, oh, shit, we've got to double up coverage on Raymond or else he's going to score. But then how do we also double up coverage on Dylan Larkin while also covering Alex to bring it? So you're right. That could be one of the most dangerous lines in hockey because Alex to bring a facilitator and a goal scorer. Dylan Larkin's a facilitator and a goal scorer. Lucas Raymond has no problem facilitating either, and he can score like the wind, apparently. So. Those three guys together, and again, even if you have to switch it up a little bit during the season and you put Patrick Kane on that top line with a Larkin mm -hmm. and a Raymond, or you put Vladimir Tarasenko on that top line with a Larkin and a Raymond, you've got interchangeable scoring threats that still makes that top line a legitimate threat, regardless yeah. of who you 
swap out for that left wing position. And, and what I love about that flippable threat, we know we've known for years, and I was hoping when Tarasenko was trying to first become a UFA back in like 2017, there's a tweet. I said, go get him. We know that the school, the goal scoring is there. I think when we talked about it, when he first got signed, that that was an immediate upgrade over David Perron. It's a different type of player, arguably, but you're still, the focus is going to be offensive. And now you've got a fully healthy Patrick Kane. We've already seen videos of them in the off season get, doing their thing with Comper. But you think about this and you had Larkin at 33 goals, Raymond cracked 31. Cat, even with his, what you could argue was an off year, still finished with 27 goals. Now you put these guys at a high level. If Raymond carries that momentum in, you're going to have a t- three 30 goal scorers potentially in your top line. Yeah, which is something we haven't seen in forever. Exactly. I think we were. Was that Datsuk, Zetterberg, and Hosa? That team was better Hossa, than the 08. 40, team. Franzen, 34, Datsuk, 32, Zetterberg, 31, and then Yuri Hoodler with 23. Five 20 goal scorers, or 20 or more goal scorers. Yeah, it would be the first time since that Stanley Cup challenging team, which we're not going to talk about. Yeah, let's team. not go down that ro- rabbit let's, hole. I know what you're going to say. And let's I was not, in Detroit for game seven. It was. Let's do it again. Do it again, guys. Run it yeah. back. I think it'll be good to have 330 goal scores. So if we can do that, yeah. get us 330 goal scores, I think we're making some progress and we're that much closer okay. to the playoffs. Hey, guys. So Vladimir Tarasenko is a guy that could still put 25 to 30 yeah. in the net, too. Yeah, but I'm totally. going to temper expectations. I, I mean, the biggest thing you look at is what Perron did. Score. And it wasn't necessarily five on five, which he actually did well five on five. But I think where you want Perron or, excuse me, Tarasenko to excel is going to be power play. And if that's something that you can help, if he can continue that momentum that they had from last season and push for that 23% top 15 power play again, you're going to be in a darn good spot. They need that's that's going to be their specialty teams need to repeat last season to give them an opportunity. You know how they talk about like goal scorers, goals? Vladimir Tarasenko can can put the puck in the net when it doesn't look like there's a chance that the puck's going in the net. He can still he get, he can pick a corner. Um, so uh, th- there's some players on this team that can score. Remember a couple of years ago, we were talking about a team that really couldn't score. They defended decently enough, but they just couldn't keep the puck out of their own net. Well, now they could score. So, and and hopefully adding Tarasenko and subtracting Perron and, and, you know, a, a healthy year of Kane, uh, another year of Raymond, obviously oh. Larkin and, well, what's what's going to matter more than anything else, other than just scoring goals, is keeping the puck out of their own net. Yes, because that's... for the longest time we saw a goal differential of plus fifteen and plus twenty, and then as the season went on, we saw that shrink to zero, and they finished with what a plus three. Yeah, they can't repeat that. They're one of the first teams in the last several years, and I know we talked about this. I forget who all it was to not make the playoffs with a positive goal differential. And then you had the Capitals sneak in with their ugly negative, and then they got destroyed. They need to have that positive, but it needs to be spread out. It can't be a 50-50 split because that's where you run into what we just saw with this past season and how it ended. And you're thinking you're in, and then within 30 seconds, you're out. With that, we are going to take our commercial break. We'll be right back after a message from BetterHelp and DraftKings to talk about. We have one more subject before the end of the night. We'll talk about that. And then we will uh, sign off. So we'll be right back. Give us one minute. Bet the action on the ice with DraftKings Sportsbook. It's never too early to get in your Stanley Cup predictions for the 24-25 season. Maybe not the Detroit Red Wings, but hey, maybe you think Connor McDavid and the Edmonton Oilers might actually pull it off this time. So download the app now and use code THPN. New customers can get 150 bucks instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on hockey. That's code THPN, only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. The crown is yours. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or text H-O-P-E-N-Y 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. 
the dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. NHL and the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of the National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2024. All rights reserved. This episode of the Grindline Podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. Give online therapy a try at betterhelp.com slash thpn and get on your way to being your best self. In the age of social media, it looks like everyone has their life on track, but you only see the surface. Comparison is a thief of joy, and it's easy to envy other people's lives. It might look like they have it all together on their Instagram, but in reality, they probably don't. If the perfect social media lives of others are having you down, therapy can help you focus on what you want instead of what others have, so you can start living your best life. Just remember that everyone needs a little bit of help sometimes. It's helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries, and empowers you to be the best version of yourself. It isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma but also those who are having just trouble in their life in general. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Stop comparing and start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash THPN today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash THPN. And we're back. And what we are going to close the show out with tonight is we're going to talk a little bit about offer sheets. So over the week, the Edmonton Oilers lost two players, uh, Broberg and Holloway, to offer sheets to the St. Louis Blues. Basically, the Blues signed Broberg to two years at 4.58 and some change, and Holloway to two years at 2.29 and some change. Uh, AAV. So that's uh, Broberg on a roughly $9 million deal and Holloway on a roughly $2.5 million deal. And Edmonton received a 2025 second and third as compensation for those offer sheets. There was another pity trade after that. They like gave them another third round pick for like future considerations. But then they're like, oh, well, everyone's like, oh, there's going to be bad blood. And there's like, what? Well, no one ever does offer sheets anymore. And then a really fun quote from Doug Armstrong came out where he said, if there's a GM code not to do offer sheets, nobody emailed it to me. It was reported I wouldn't have done this to Kenny Holland. That's not the truth. I'd do it to my mother if she was managing the Oilers. So again, we go back to the whole, is it bad blood between GMs when they try and essentially steal another team's player, uh, just to have to give them the draft capital compensation if the other team can't match. Now, the Oilers could have matched. They totally could have. But With the that's an made, overpay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, but that's an overpay on Broberg. That is debatably an overpay on Holloway based on what they had done in their career previously. But those are two guys that the Blues feel can help their organization going forward. They're young players. And there are still some players out there that have not been signed, mainly Lucas Raymond and Mo Sider. Uh, Jeremy Swayman it still doesn't have a contract, and he's an RFA. You've got someone like Thomas Harley for Dallas that is an RFA, doesn't have a contract. And I feel like maybe something like this is like a domino to fall to where now other teams are like, well, they got two players, and they didn't match the offer sheets, and they had to give up this compensation. Do we maybe see more offer sheets or... Is it kind of trying to bury the whole GM code and and there are still GMs that might still be afraid of it? I think that personally, I think the offer sheet is a sneaky thing. I think it's, I think it's within the rules, obviously. So, uh, but I feel like it's one of those things that like pops up every so often and that it never sticks. Like I remember in the nineties, I think, was it, was it Ottawa that offer sheeted Steve Eisenman or was it was it better off? On February 26th of 1998, Carmanos and the Hurricanes offer sheeted Sergei Fedorov for $38 million over six years. Okay. So I either way, it seems like it pops up every so often and then it never sticks. You saw those in the 90s, then you had the Shea Weber one in like 2010 or whatever it was with the Flyers and then Nashville matched it and then it came, you have a contract <laughs> right and then you had the one with, with sebastian aho that the hurricanes off that the hurricanes offer sheeted oh sorry the the canadians offer sheeted the hurricanes and sebastian aho 
And then the Canadians reversed it on the Hurricanes and took the some, old, just very you know, caught Kaniemi. So the switcheroo. The Hurricanes offer sheet of just Barry Cock and the Emmy from the Montreal Canadiens, and they got him because Montreal didn't match it. So I don't know, man. It feels like it pops up every couple of years, and it never sticks. But I feel like this could be the time where it does because, I mean, you, you feel you like right, nowadays things are more advanced. Things are like GMs are trying to do every last thing to make their team better. And if you can take someone's player like a Philip Broberg or Dylan Holloway, and you could do it for essentially nothing. Why the fuck wouldn't you? Well, I mean, it's 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 simple. I mean, you've got teams that are still in salary cap hell, Edmonton, and teams that are currently not and have flexibility not only with picks but also the cap. And really, w- when you look at what they went for, they kept it simple, and that was, I think, the genius part about it. They lost a third round pick and a second round pick. When you look at a situation, though, with Cider and Raymond, now you're talking about teams that are going to have to give up probably a first, second, and third for one of them. Or, multi- but, yeah, multiple picks. Yeah, depending on what the pay range comes in. Because they come in, so a first, second, and third round pick would be between 6.87 and 9.16 million. You go over that 9.16 up to 11.45, it's two firsts, a second, and a third. Oof. That's a lot of capital, and we know a how ton. much they love their picks. So, and especially if it's a first round pick, because most of these teams that have the ability to do it, and if I recall, here's where I really miss Cap Friendly and wish Puckpedia would get this together, is there were very few teams that have the ability to offer, make that type of an offer sheet where they have all of those picks available for a cider or a Raymond. And that's where it works out in Detroit's favor and where Iserman can take his sweet old time going into this next month, which, hey, tick tock, we are like three weeks away from camp, no big deal. But uh, anyways, no, and Steve Eisenman, it'll get signed like with probably day one, three hours yeah. before camp. You ever play uh, you ever play Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask? Nope. Or like no. the moon is falling and then a screen pops up that says dawn of the second day, 24 hours remain. I feel like it's that's what happens every day that goes by where. Lucas, I feel like you just Raymond. you have to make that now just to have it. Yeah, ready. I could. It'd just be like Steve Eiserman's face falling into the planet, and it would say it would it would do that pop up. But I, that's what I picture every day that goes by where there is not a contract signed for those two. I never understood personally why why like fans and why why people get upset about offer sheets. It's like that's something that's available that nobody uses. I don't know if it's just an unwritten rule that you're not quote unquote supposed to use it but i don't know if you've seen over the last five years a lot of the unwritten rules of sports are starting to go away so maybe this is one that could tyler i think it's the fine line argument like we were saying earlier it's that if you're offer sheeting a guy that is in a low value range chances are the team that you're offer sheeting is going to match it if you're offer sheeting a guy that is in a high value range, you have to give up a ton of picks, which you probably don't want to do. So that's where the I think the offer sheet becomes tricky, not because of an unwritten rule, but because of the guys that you would say, oh, it's an RFA like Jeremy Swayman, go offer sheet him this much money. And then you have to give up a first, a second and a third round pick. And then you're like, well, if this doesn't work out for us, we're kind of screwed in the upcoming drafts. We've wasted this draft capital. We don't pick in the first three rounds now, and we dropped, and we didn't even make the playoffs. So that's the, there's, it's kind of a catch 22 where, sure, you can offer sheet these $2 million guys, but chances are the team that has them is going to resign them and match the sheet. And then at that point, you're just left looking stupid. And then on the other hand, they're, they're going to cost you way too much draft capital to potentially not be worth it. The Blues just became a better hockey team. Uh, are they the best team in the Western Conference? No. no, but they definitely just got better. Sure. But again, they they're giving up draft depth. capital to do it. Mm-hmm. A second and a third? I mean, I would have done that if I'm the Red Wings. So are we pro offer sheet or are we not pro offer sheet? I'm pro offer sheet. There, there needs to be more drama when it comes to free agency and the likes with hockey. Because we, we the trades more often than not are boring. The offer sheet stuff is usually the most fun we have. 
because we see one front office just completely shit themselves, which is basically what we just saw with Bowman and Edmonton. And we saw that with who was in charge at the time with Edmonton or uh, Montreal. It just, it makes it fun. And I'm not saying that it's great for the players per se. I get it. That's the aspect that does suck, but it's an entertainment business. And like what we, the quote you just read a little bit ago, like it's, you, you are, it is a business and they're, they have a job to make their team better. And if you can do it and you have the capital to do, to go for it, why not? I don't see why you wouldn't. Especially if you're a team that's struggling. Like you, I, there's no reason why some of these lower teams really shouldn't do it more. The because Blues are one of those franchises that have been, since they won the Stanley Cup in 2019, they're kind of blah, right? Yeah. Broberg and Holloway, are they guys that are going to make your team less blah? Not really, but they're good hockey players, and they're still young. Broberg was one of the Oilers' best defensemen in the Stanley Cup final. So, I, and Dylan I Holloway also, is a good young player. I am also team maximum chaos. So I agree yeah, with the offer sheet, especially since the, the salary cap does everything in its power to make everything else so boring and bring down the temperature of everything because you only got so much money and all of you are already basically at the top. So well, trades can't be as exciting and they can't do these huge, like a huge blockbuster is very rare because you got to be able to make the money work. So Guys stealing other players, guys, if it adds a little bit of excitement, I'm 100% for it. And honestly, you should almost have it. How fun of a rule would it be if you're a bottom five team that is struggling to get to the salary cap floor, that part of your shtick is going after a player via an offer sheet to not only, one, not suck, but two, expend your assets and actually try to do something instead of just trying to scrape the floor with your knuckles. I'll say one thing. Everyone always gives shit. I, I agree with that, Ryan. I, I think that would be how that would crazy be en- would that be? Incredibly crazy and incredibly entertaining. But my my point is, is like everyone always talks about how they want the NHL to have a soft salary cap and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I like the way it is. You can have a team like the Florida Panthers win the Stanley Cup. You can have a team like the, I, I don't know, there's been teams that have got the Phoenix Coyotes got to the Western Conference Finals. The LA Kings have won two Stanley Cups. The Blues won the Stanley Cup a couple years ago in 2019. The Vegas Golden Knights literally just came into the NHL and won the Stanley Cup a couple years into their existence. Like, I like the way that the league is. I know it might be boring at times, but the way the league is set up, every team has a chance to win the Stanley Cup. I mean, not every single year, but If you build it correctly and your owner is willing to spend to the cap, you can win the Stanley Cup no matter what market you're in. I like that. A team like Calgary could wreak havoc on RFAs right now if they wanted to, but they won't. No, they won't. They've got Uh, two first each of the next two years and two seconds this year, one next year. Like they could easily go after someone and be like, I still got a first round pick. (laughs) I agree. So let's uh, sign off, Ryan. You go first. Uh, Chat GPT is fun to make random images. So if you haven't seen the random stuff I posted, uh, go check it out. It's funny, or at least pretty sweet. I like the armored one, and I posted an octopus one, and it sounds like someone wants to make it a tattoo. Keith does. So go do that. That'd be awesome, and we'll love it. Uh, All right, Aaron, 33. Yeah, I mean, my final thoughts are we're getting close to hockey season, man. You're going to start seeing these guys on the ice soon, and 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 then it's really going to hit because you know we're what a month away from preseason games starting. I mean we're we're almost in the thick of it, guys. I mean I know I know everyone's still enjoying their summer, doing whatever with the the warm weather, but when you when this month ends in what nine days or so, we're going to be in September, and I believe what's the middle of September training camp. Well, the prospect tournament starts yeah. end of September. Training yeah. camp. Yep. Oh, okay. About a month September. out from now. So, so we're about a month out. Exactly. I can't wait. I don't know about you guys. I can't wait, but you can follow me on Twitter at seal dog 91. Yeah. You can follow me online at bringing the wing. You follow the Grand Line podcast online at Grand Line pod. We can thank the hockey podcast network for hosting us and spreading us around. 
I would thank Vintage Detroit, which is the only place you should get your Detroit jerseys from and worked on. Please head over to YouTube, sub to our channel, turn on the notifications. You'll get notified every time a video goes live. But that is going to do it for us tonight. So for Ryan and Tyler, I am Greg. You stay classy, Akito.